Baba Ali Show, Episode 3, Muslims, Sex, Islam, and Intimacy. This podcast has been brought to you by HalfRDeen.com, a Muslim marriage website designed for those who want to find their other half privately, because the only people that should know you're looking to get married are people who are looking to get married. Try Half Our Dean today. This episode of the Bubba Ali Show is not suitable for kids and is meant for an adult audience. In today's show, we have a marriage and family therapist who discuss a very important topic, Muslims, sex, Islam, and intimacy. Four words are probably Googled quite often. This is something you'll never hear about in a masjid or at an Islamic conference. If you're about to get married, you need to listen to this episode. If you're already married, you definitely need to listen to this episode because you need to know what's up. Make sure your headphones are on because we're going to go live in three, two, one. In a world where cultural Muslims have confused the masses and speakers are forced to be politically correct, rises one man, one voice, who changed everything. Hey man, why are you all serious? This is just a podcast. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Welcome to the Bob Ali Show. I'm your host, Bob Ali. If you come from a Muslim family, it's very unlikely your parents ever told you where you came from. Dad, where did I come from? The same country I came from. You were born back home. I mean, where do babies come from? They come from the hospital. Mother and father, they walk into the hospital and they walk out with baby. No, I mean, how was I made? Oh, ah, ah. you see, human beings are made out of clay and water. Huh? When you were a kid and you asked your dad, where do babies come from? He told you to go speak to your mom. And when you asked your mom, she told you to go speak to your dad. You basically got to run around and you end up asking your friends at school, which were as clueless as you were, which left you even more confused. Or worse, you asked Sheikh Google and end up on a site that scarred you for life. Eventually, you're going to get to the age of where you're looking to get married and you're going to start thinking about the wedding night. You want to learn about what is permissible in Islam when it comes to sex, but you don't know who to ask. It's not you're going to hear a khutbah about it anytime soon. So you end up in the Islamic bookstore looking for the book. Yeah, you know what book I'm talking about. It's that one book in the back of the store that talks about intimacy, what's allowed, what's not, and what you need to know. And you're doing all this because you actually care about doing things in the halal way, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what happens when that book just doesn't exist in your local bookstore? then you're stuck. Believe it or not, some people have no idea how the whole sex thing works until the night of the wedding. In fact, many people who are married right now aren't happy in the bedroom because their spouse has no idea that the opposite gender is wired totally different than them. And that brings us to today's guest to help us tackle this issue. He's a marriage and family therapist and has helped countless couples overcome marriage issues. He has his master's degree in marriage and family therapy and his bachelor's degree in psychology. He has experience working with couples to help bring tranquility back to their marriage and provides premarital counseling. And that is so important in today's time when the divorce rate is on the rise. He helps individuals, couples, and families suffering from depression, anxiety, and other life struggles. I would like to welcome Usman Mughni. Welcome to the Baba Ali Show. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So let me start off by asking you a question. When a couple has marriage issues, they are debating if they should go see the imam or if they go see a marriage therapist. The religious people will want to see the imam and the non-religious people want to go see a therapist. But that doesn't really make sense because those two roles do two completely different things. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, a, that's an excellent point. The first thing we have to realize is that imams are not trained to handle not just marriage therapy, but different even psychological issues, depression, anxiety, things like this. I think we as a community have began to view our imams as these people which were just multiple hats are and are supposed to be able to solve every problem in the world but uh, that's not the case and the imam's primary role is is to really just lead the community spiritually teach courses bring them closer to the quran and the sunnah the irony of that statement that irreligious people go to therapists is that the reason i came into therapy was because of imams in fact majority of referrals that we get are from imams which are saying that they're constantly inundated with all of these quests for marriage therapy and you know uh, trouble with their children and depression 
and anxiety and drug addiction where they're saying that, you know, this is not my job. I don't know how to deal with this. You need to go to a professional. Interesting, because I've actually heard that about 90% of the issues that come to imams are marriage and family related. Have you heard the same? Yes, yes. Actually, the reason that I came into this field was because an imam and a scholar, which I greatly look up to and a dear friend of mine, Sheikh Safi Khan from College Park, Maryland, he sat with me in 2008 and we were discussing, you know, some of the needs of the community. And he said that, you know, Osman, 90 plus percent of my time is actually dedicated to counseling couples, counseling families, counseling individuals, and things which I'm actually really not trained in. And I want to be able to free up my time to actually teach the community, to guide the community, and do things which I'm actually trained on. And so he really encouraged me. He said that there is a lack of Muslim professionals which are able to tackle these issues. So that's really what inspired me to go into this field, was to actually relieve the burden from the imams. Wow. So tell me a little bit more about your organization and how you guys are set up differently than other organizations. Our objective is to really provide a counseling service to individuals, couples, and Muslim families struggling with a you know a variety of different issues, be it anxiety, depression, addiction, and everything in between. But we also want to form a healthy merger between Islam and therapy. And we also have a scholar on staff, Sheikh uh, Jazi McKenzie, who is a graduate of Jamit al Medina, and he also holds master's degree from Vanderbilt, Mashallah, and quite a few years of experience in Dawah. So we like to merge the two. So, you know, there are fiqh issues which come up, but even with fiqh issues, you have to know the background. You have to understand the psychology. So we try and address these issues in a very comprehensive manner and not just a one-size-fits-all fatwa. So if I remember correctly, you actually study Sharia as well. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I, I, I did study formally under a few different scholars as well. But my role is uh, not to give fatwa, and this is why we have our full-time scholar on staff specifically for these issues. So we do get cases of divorce and things like this where they need specific rulings. So we, we do have our scholar, Sheikh Jazi McKenzie, to help out with this. My contribution is the therapy aspect, to handle the, the issues from a very just personal standpoint for the couple. So, you know, helping them with what they're struggling with, helping to improve communication, helping to maybe overcome some past traumas which are affecting the relationship, helping them to understand each other better. And, you know, a lot of times, Ali, like people don't understand or realize what type of training, you know, goes into becoming a marriage and family therapist. It actually takes about nine years to become, wow. yeah, that's not even your doctorate. Because I've, I've had people actually ask me, do you have to go to school for this? And it's like, no, dude, I just, you know, randomly just opened up shop and tried to help people. So, so yeah, I mean, there, you know, there's a specific licensing process. One thing people might be concerned about is the confidentiality or how private these sessions are. Can you touch upon that a little bit? When people go to imams, you know, obviously there is this level of trust that, you know, if I share something very personal, it won't be shared with the rest of the community. Uh, with therapists, we take it a step further because we're legally bound by this. What I mean by that is part of our medical license. Like, I will lose my license if I ever disclose anything about any client. So, I mean, we take it extremely serious. So, when we say that whatever is stated in the therapy room will remain in the therapy room, we mean it. You know, this whole topic, people are kind of like hesitant to even listen to because they don't know what Islam says about it. They're like Because the word sex is often used in a way that's very taboo, it's almost like saying a bad word, but it's not. In fact, Islam is very explicit about this and discusses this. Can you touch upon that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think this is where the problem comes in, is that people don't realize how explicit Islam is about some of these issues. I mean, the Prophet wasallam, he came to guide us on all aspects of our life, and that includes what goes on in the bedroom. So there are explicit hadith about you know, kissing your wife, about foreplay, about what type of intercourse is and isn't allowed. And so these were things which the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were exposed to and knew about when they were going into marriage, you know? So it wasn't, they weren't left clueless. Fortunately, nowadays, you know, we think that it's some type of great sin to talk about this. I mean, whether we talk about it or not, these issues don't go away. We have to come to terms with some of the social realities we are facing. And I think later on we'll talk about like pornography addiction, you know, sex addiction, things like this. These are realities that our Muslim communities are exposed to, we can't just assume that we're immune to some of these vices. What happens uh, is that you have two people which, you know, never really thought about it. They never spoke to their parents about it, might have consulted with Sheikh Google about intimacy <laughs> and so on. Then you have these two people which, you know, bam, they're spending the first night together and they are clueless as to what to do, what not to do, completely different expectations. And that's when the problems start to arise. I mean, I've had many couples come to me and say, from day one, from the wedding night, we had intimacy issues. And then it just snowballed into something bigger from there. So what's the biggest problem
problem when it comes to intimacy for couples? I mean, tell me about what's the biggest problem from the female side and what's the biggest problem from the male side. Firstly, interestingly enough, it's the women complaining about, you know, physical intimacy, about their husbands not touching them. Wow. You would think... You would think it's the other way, right? You would think it would be the opposite way. You, yeah, exactly. You would think the males would be the one complaining that they want more intimacy, but it seems to be the exact opposite. So please continue. Women complain of a lack of intimacy in and out of the bedroom, you know? So, you know, this is one of the points to, to mention. I mean, although we're, we're talking specifically about what goes on inside the bedroom, I mean, there is a level of intimacy which should occur outside of the bedroom. And we have numerous narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi kissing his wives as he enters the house, as he leaves the house. Mm -hmm. You hug your wife, hold her hand, you know, do these type of things so that, you know, when, when what goes on in the bedroom seems more natural. So you're not going from zero to 100, you know. If you don't kiss your wife outside of this, you're not going to all of a sudden just get in the mood. So this is something really important, is that there is intimacy all throughout the marriage, in and out of the bedroom. This is what helps actually women when it comes to intimacy. And one thing that we do have to realize is that there is a huge difference between men and women when it comes to intimacy. And the more we understand that difference, the better we are at solving these problems. I mean, Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran, He says, وَلَيْسَ ذَكْرُ كَالْأُنْثَى you know, in all senses, that the woman is not like the man, and the man is not like the woman. When it comes to intimacy, men are aroused much easier. So the man is like a microwave, and the woman is like an oven. <laughs> That's an excellent analogy, absolutely. And so men, I mean, sometimes all it takes is just some type of visual stimuli. They see something attractive, and all of a sudden they're in the mood. Whereas women, it might take a lot more. You know, there's an emotional connection there. So we're, we're talking about words of affection. We're talking about, you know, starting off with just maybe a little bit of foreplay. And this is also, like I mentioned, something explicit in Islam about the importance of foreplay uh, so that it's enjoyable for the woman as well. So let me ask you a question. We know one of the big topics we have, and maybe I can cover this in a future episode, and that is regarding pornography and the effect it has on intimacy. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I cannot actually even stress, Ali, how much this issue comes up. I mean, it is so prevalent. I would go as far as to say it maybe like 80 to 90 percent of the couples that I do counseling with, there is some issue of pornography. And the reality is, I mean, we are exposed to it on a daily basis. I mean, it's in front of our face, you know, billboards, and then you have everything on the phones. I mean, it is, it is a great time of fitna that we're living in. And there are young brothers, which, uh, and it just happens with the sisters as well, which will view, a, you know, a certain amount of pornography before the marriage. And this really affects uh, intimacy later on in marriage. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? How does it affect it? Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, I mean, just the expectation when it comes to sex. So pornography, we have to realize, I mean, this is something which it's just a complete facade, right? So the idea of beauty, the idea of, you know, how women get aroused, how men get aroused, so on, is completely false in pornography. So men, sometimes when they view this, I mean, they have this idea that a woman should look like this, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is exactly how sex is done, you know? And so it's just from appreciating their wife, appreciating that physical beauty, that becomes distorted. The whole idea of, of even sex and how it's done and how it foreplay. So when somebody engages in pornography, what they tend to do is really they'll fast forward to the scenes where they want to see and they will, you know, um, and I do apologize for being explicit, but like I said, we, we, we do have to be very open about this topic in order to really address it. I mean, they'll masturbate to the parts where they want to see, you know, so they're in full control. It's very selfish. And so they will actually ejaculate at a you know very early stage. And this leads to sometimes developing premature ejaculation so that when it comes to real sex, uh, they're not able to satisfy their wives. Wow. I never knew this pornography issue was that common within couples. It almost sounds like an addiction. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, before that, Ali, if, I, I just want to just, you know, specifically for the sisters, I, I, I do want to mention this point because I've seen how prevalent pornography addiction is. I, I, I do want to say that, you know, there is, you know, an element of almost addiction. And, you know, I really encourage couples to try and work together to move forward from it rather than pointing fingers, rather than shaming, because at the end of the day, that doesn't really accomplish anything. I mean, there is a way to move forward from it. I've alhamdulillah had the opportunity to help a lot of people struggling with this addiction before and after marriage, and you can overcome it, but really it takes support from both spouses. And of course, you know, there is going to be, you know, the anger, there is going to be hurt feelings. You know, the woman will feel like, well, was I not good enough and so on. Uh, just, just, just realize that, you know, the goal is to improve the marriage. So blaming, pointing fingers, shaming is not going to get us very far. This is not a, uh, an immediate reason to, you know, separate or divorce from your husband, as, as hurtful as it is. So, you know, this topic itself, intimacy, sex, Muslims, Islam, we've been, alhamdulillah, very fortunate to cover a bunch of it. But eventually, there's going to come to a point that these people are going to get married and the wedding night will come up. Do you have any tips to help the males or to help the females in this aspect? 
Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So the, the, the first thing is that we really need to learn to be open and honest with our spouses. I mean, realize that the relationship between the husband and wife is a relationship unlike any other. I mean, subhanAllah, when, when Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ That uh, when God speaks about, and this is in Surah Al-Rum, He speaks about marriage and He speaks about from His signs, is, is that He created from you spouses, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا That you may, you may live with them, you may reside with them, and he has placed mercy and, and love uh, between them. This is, this is something truly to ponder over. Realize that this is something very, very special. This is a, a special relationship unlike any other. And, you know, part of this being special is that you should learn to be comfortable discussing whatever with your wife. I mean, that's the one person, your wife or your husband, that's the one person which you could share anything with, including intimacy, including issues of, you know, what one's likes are and dislikes. So the first thing I would say is open communication. Even from day one, talk to your wife about what you find attractive. Wives, talk to your husbands about what you find attractive, what you like, what you don't like. And it's a learning experience, you know? Mm -hmm. Honestly, this is your wife is halal for you and your husband is halal for you. So have fun with it, you know? <laughs> okay. I, I, I mean that. Have fun with it. One, one, of the, you know, one, of, one of the purposes of marriage in our religion is to protect us from zina. And, uh, and, and, you know, in fact, a lot of people don't know this, but you actually get reward for having sex in Islam. Yes. You, you get reward for having sex with your spouse. I mean, how beautiful religion is that and because if you think about it you know you get sin for doing it in an illicit manner yes so you get reward for doing it in a halal manner yes of course so you're enjoying yourself you're getting reward so you know this is something you need to be open about with your wife you, if the wife doesn't like a certain thing you know be open and say you know this didn't really make me arouse as much as if you do this and the husband same thing you know, this actually is what makes me more aroused. Husbands might like wives to dress up a certain way. You know, wives, same thing. You know, so another tip along with just, you know, being very open and honest with each other without shaming each other, but just saying that, look, you know, we're both in this together. We're both going to try and enjoy this. So let's be open is, is, is even the idea of, so I'll, I'll address the sisters first and then the brothers. Sisters. Once you get married, I mean, during the wedding night, everything you dress up for your husband, you you know, you look your best. Slowly, as the months and years go by, for some reason, I, I think I've seen this a lot, where the women they they forget this and they become more interested in getting ready to go out to like different sisters' gatherings. And when it comes to their appearance at home, it's just like, okay, I can still wear the same, you know, I don't mean if husband the same raggedy jilbab for like a week, you know, and it's all good because now he's my husband. But realize that your husband. He's going out to work every day, and he's seeing the secretary. He's seeing the billboards. He's exposed to this constantly, yeah. you know? And so, I mean, it's not the most appealing thing when he comes home and he sees you. And I understand, I mean, he's taking care of the kids, this and that. But, you know, it's not the most appealing thing when he sees you and just, like, you know, really making no effort to, to dress up and so on. You know, this is something which should be, you know, sh should be done once in a while. But the same goes for men as well, right? I mean, you know, you, you, uh, you start off, like, you know, doing all different types of diets and everything, getting ready for the wedding, you're getting all ripped. And then, you know, a few months to a year down the line, you develop a huge belly and the whole idea of staying in shape just goes out the window. The Prophet also taught us that the woman, you know, like what the men like. I mean, the physical attraction is important to women as well. Yeah, I think sometimes people ignore that, especially men, because they think, okay, the woman's not built this way, so I'm going to tell her to stay in shape, but for me, ah. Uh... Exactly, exactly. Guys, I mean, you know, stay in shape for your woman. You know, work out, do some cardio. And, and uh, I mean, again, without, you know, trying to be too vulgar, I mean, even the act of sex itself, it burns a lot of calories, you know. So it's, uh, it, it, you know, it does require some stamina. You, part of intimacy and part of, you know, appropriate intimacy is, is, is making sure that your wife is satisfied as well. I mean, if you are, you know, morbidly obese and just not taking care of yourself, you're going you're gonna to tire out within a minute. So, I mean, this is also important in the marriage, just as wives are to, you know, take care of themselves and their appearance and beautify themselves for their husbands. Husbands, first and foremost, husbands need to do the same thing, yeah. you know. You're not trying to stay in shape just to, you know, go walk on the beach and show off your muscles, but you're trying to stay in shape for your family. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's a lot of good tips for the female side. For the male side, what tips do you have for the brothers that are listening? Okay, absolutely. Yeah, so, so now this is where we get a little bit explicit. So I'm going to talk about just a few points, right? So we spoke about the consequences of pornography. Sometimes it could lead to premature ejaculation. It could lead to just, like, you know, not knowing how to arouse the woman and vice versa. So there's a few things we have to keep in mind, right? So we want to be open and honest about, you know, everything which goes on in the bedroom with our spouse.
spouses. There is a condition which is known as erectile dysfunction, okay, ED. You know, very common now, I'm sure, for guys, I mean, this is something they can comfortably talk to their primary care physician about as well. One thing I want to address is erectile dysfunction. How do you know if it's psychological or medical? Okay, if it's medical, this is something that, you know, can be treated with medications, possibly surgery. This is something you talk to your doctor about. Sometimes it's psychological, and this is the effect of pornography, right? So if you're constantly watching that, and that's the only thing you can get aroused, and you see your wife and you're not aroused, it might be psychological. First of all, how do you know the difference? Because we want to figure out if it's medical or if it's psychological. So interestingly enough, males, any, any healthy male, will have a few erections while they're sleeping at night. So this is common, where while they're sleeping, uh, irrespective of the dreams they have, whatever, they will have an erection. So there are devices on the market, very simple devices, which you put over the private area, you put over the penis, and you wear it before you go to bed. What it's supposed to do is it's a seal which goes around the penis, and when the seal breaks, that means that you had an erection at night. Okay, so when you wake up in the morning, you check the seal and you see that, oh, okay, it's broken. That means that I am physically able to get an erection. But there's something psychological which is not allowing me to get an erection with my wife during intercourse. So it's not a medical issue. It's a psychological issue. So that device for the people who are listening, that's going to help them determine if it's a psychological or medical issue. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Because you want to rule out exactly what the problem is. So if it's, if it's medical, there are options that you can speak to your physician about. If it's psychological, this is, what, this is more of the area where therapy will help. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, once you've determined that, there are a few techniques. So one thing is, especially if, you know, the woman is not able to achieve orgasm or the man is just having difficulty, one thing that I do recommend for couples, this is a sex therapy technique, is something which we call fasting, fasting from sex. So the rules are this, that the couple will agree that for two weeks, every time they're in the bedroom, they're only going to limit their intimacy to kissing and touching, no taking off of clothes, no penetration, and they're going to try this every night. And so what's actually going to happen is that the urge is going to build up. So they're kissing, they're massaging each other, they are but not seeing each other naked, and uh, they're not actually engaging in the sex. So come the end of two weeks, they are fully ready for sex, and it'll become a very natural transition without that anxiety, without that, that stress from the wife or the husband. So this is, this is one technique that we do incorporate in therapy for couples which are, which are, which are just struggling overall with sex. Another thing I had mentioned was the idea of premature ejaculation. So like we said that, you know, males which are viewing a lot of pornography, they get used to getting themselves aroused and then, you know, ejaculating in a matter of a few minutes, right? Which when it comes to pleasing the wife, that's, I mean, that's going to leave women very, very upset. And a lot of sisters have complained to me just about the idea that they're not satisfied, you know, when it comes to intimacy. So th there is a specific technique for this. There's a few, but I'll, I'll, ju I'll just share one. And again, we're getting very explicit here, but, you know, there shouldn't be any shyness about this. And I think the benefits of talking about this definitely, definitely outweigh the harm. So this is something which both the husband and wife can work together on. Uh, if, if the husband wants to basically increase his stamina and stop the premature ejaculation, and we've, like again, and we've ruled out that this is not a medical problem. Well, one technique to do is that as a man is climaxing and he feels that he's about to ejaculate, either his wife or himself, what he'll do is he'll squeeze the tip of the penis with his uh, forefinger and his thumb and just hold it and take a few deep breaths in and out, take a few deep breaths in and out, and so that he restricts himself from ejaculating. He'll wait a few seconds to maybe a minute or so, and then go back to intimacy with his wife. And then just as he's about to reach the point of ejaculation, he'll do that again. He'll take his forefinger and his thumb, and he'll squeeze the tip of his penis, and take a few deep breaths in and out, and wait for the erection to, to, to go down just a little bit. And so what this does is it helps to increase the stamina and control the ejaculation, and this gets the male to a point where he's able to satisfy the woman and then ejaculate. And this is, I think, going to help a lot of couples out there, including those who are already married. Absolutely. Yeah. So people out there who are single looking to get married and people who are already married, I think this is going to be very useful things for them to know. And again, this is not something you're ever going to hear in a khutbah, but it's information as Muslims we should know and learn because at the very end, we are trying to make our spouse happy and it's good for us to learn everything within a song. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, think about the bigger picture. We're living in a society which is just filled with, you know, things to lead us astray. Like, you know, I mentioned, like every commercial that you see, there's, you know, um, attractive man or attractive woman, leading us, you know, to zina. Marriage is the institution which protects us. It's the shelter. It's the, it's the shelter and protection from this fitna. And so if we're to truly be protected, we need to be fulfilling that need, both for men and women, within the boundaries of the marriage. This is why it's such an important topic. What happens when there's actual problems in the bedroom? I and mean, how bad does the situation 
can get in the actual marriage? I mean, how, how does it affect the marriage? You know, couples might be getting along in other areas of their life, but I mean, I've seen so many cases of, you know, both men and women saying, I mean, it's been months, you know, before, since they actually had intimacy. And of course, this, you know, this tension is built up and it affects the way that they look at each other, the way that they communicate with each other. And there's just this frustration. And I've had so many brothers and sisters saying that we feel like we're roommates and not husband and wife anymore. I mean, the intimacy is just gone. And, you know, I would really, really recommend that people try and tackle this issue. Talk to a professional sooner than later because the longer you wait, the more the frustration, the anger, you know, the low self-esteem, the, the depression, all of this builds up. These are all consequences of just that lack of intimacy. Oh, you know, a lot of sisters have told me that I just, I don't feel beautiful anymore. I don't feel that, you know, like, like a woman. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and same with the man. I mean, just, you know, just, just extremely just frustrated. Like, what do I do? You know, this tension built up and she's busy with the kids. Nothing. I mean, there's, there's nothing left but just me and my wife. So the consequences are, are, are very severe. I mean, it affects you like emotionally, psychologically, physically, just the level of stress which is built up just on this issue alone. I mean, it affects your day to day life. That's a lot of very, very valuable information. And I'm sure people have a lot more questions that probably they're going through personally themselves. How can someone contact you if they want to discuss these issues with you, if they would like to have a session with you? Can you give us some information of how we can contact you? Yes, yes, absolutely. There's, there's a few ways to contact us. For that, let me uh, just, if, 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 Ali, if I can just briefly speak a little bit more about our organization. We don't just do marriage therapy, but we help with, uh, you know, a multitude of issues which our communities are facing. Drug addiction, pornography addiction, anxiety, depression, grief, parenting issues. So we actually, uh, Hamdul, we have a child specialist on staff who is fluent in Arabi, Sister Nagla. Mustafa, phenomenal, phenomenal therapist. She works with younger children. Sheikh Jazi McKenzie, he helps with the you know issues of spirituality. There's you know any Islamic verdicts which need to be given. And you know, and myself, I, I work a lot with adults and you know maybe teens struggling with depression, with with, with with a multitude of issues that we we like to try and sweep under the rug. But our communities, at the end of the day, we are not immune to these issues. So how to contact us? You can go to our website www.peacefulu. Uh, that's Y O U. Peaceful Y O U. Dot org, and you can contact us through our website. And actually, even cooler than that, you can actually schedule yourself for a Skype session right then and there. You can see our open time slots and just schedule yourself for a Skype session anywhere you are in the world. We have clients from all over the world at that point. You can also and like our page on Facebook. Our Facebook page is Peaceful You Counseling and Therapy Services. You can follow us on Twitter, Peaceful You Inc., Peaceful You Inc. And the easiest way to contact me is through email. It's Osman U.S. M-A-N, like U.S. man, at PeacefulU.org. That's U-S-M-A-N at PeacefulU.org. I want to remind people that anything which is said, either through uh, communication through our website, through, through email, uh, or if you want to call us, our number, excuse me, is uh, 972-413-8393. Again, that's 972-413-8393 is going to be absolutely confidential. So rest assured that myself or one of the other therapists will be the only people looking at this information and we will do everything to keep your confidentiality and your privacy maintained. So please do not hesitate. Contact us uh, sooner than later, inshallah. With that said, I would like to say Jazakallah Khair for coming onto the show. I know it's not easy talking about this topic, but it is needed. And thank you so much for providing all the information for my listeners. Well, yeah, it was my pleasure. And please go to to BubaAliShow.com. Leave your comment. We would love to hear what you think about this episode. I will try to respond to your comments, inshallah, in future episodes. And if you like this series, make sure to subscribe to it on iTunes and recommend it to friends. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.